Has everybody been able to get on and register? Has anybody not had anything to do with it yet? Yeah, that's with Ed Fowler. Mike, I'll follow up with you afterwards, no problem. Okay, so Jeannie, you need to, you did do it or you didn't do it? Okay. Could you follow up with me as well, this is Sybil. Okay, okay, I definitely will. You, what you can do is um, just send John an email, Sybil, okay? And we'll make sure we get you connected. Okay. So um, I think what we're gonna try to do is figure out whether we need to do a third you know, online webinar or whether we're gonna try to circulate the recordings of the two first ones. Um, so we will work that out and we will let everybody else, let everybody know. I mean, ideally what we're trying to work towards is being able to communicate with everyone on the portal, but we can't really do that until everybody's off registered and on the portal and using it. Um, so if you, and this really is in particular to anybody who's a tier one community-based organization, it's really important that you get yourself logged on and you know, spend some time on the portal, and, and if you run into any kind of problems, let John or myself know, and we'll, we'll troubleshoot with you for that, okay? So that was one thing. Um, along the same lines, again, this is more specific to our Tier 1 friends in the room, but, um, so we did, you know that you get money to participate in this grant, and we really want to give you the money that we can give you to participate in this grant. So I just want to remind folks that we, um, are nearing, so April 30th is our end of the extension at this point. And anything that you do uh, is an activity that counts towards um, your honorarium. So the thing that you have to be able to do so that we can give you that money is we need your documentation. And if you have not yet received an email with all of that information, although you should have probably received multiple over the course of the grant since we started working, but. Um, let John and I know. We will get out to you what, you what we need from you. And then what we'll start to do, so we're ending January 31st ends quarter five. Um, and we're going to start sending out invoices again for you to send back to us so we can pay out, start paying out more of the honorarium. Okay? So if you have any questions about that, if there's something that's not clear or you're not sure what you have to do, just follow up with us back at the office and we will make sure we connect you with that. Um, another thing I thought would be really interesting just to mention to all of you is that Health and Welfare Council, basically me, for this pur purpose, um, I've been communicating with, so the rest of state just got their grant approved at the end of December, and they're just getting started underway, and you know, we're entering sort of the last really the last year and a half of DISRIP for the most part, right? It's supposed to end in 2020. And they're just getting started on the CBO planning grant. Um, New York City, as you remember from the beginning of our work, is done. Their grant ended. And Hudson Valley and Long Island are in this no-cost extension. So, um, and I also mentioned that back in the end of November, the state had an open public comment day. And I went and gave comment on behalf of our consortium and about the work in general. Um, so now the grantees are all starting to talk to each other a little bit. Um, and we're starting to come up with some ways that we can do more advocacy work with the state, with the managed care organizations in terms of, you know, how CBOs have played a role in DISRIP in general and more specifically in what we're doing now. And um, there was a symposium in February. I'm only going for I'm getting there, it starts it's Monday through Wednesday, the 11th through the 13th. Um, and it's very, very, very much um, focused on most of the healthcare partners, but um, we were able to advocate for a booth on the first night. I won't be there, but the other CBO grantees will, so that um, there's an opportunity to really talk about and promote um, the, the value of what we're already doing. So, you know, you've heard over and over again in this whole, Kind of landscape that CBOs have to show our value, and we would argue that you know the value's always been there. Um, we just have to package it a little differently, right? So I'm I'm a little bit thrilled about this because I think that idea of kind of a statewide um, advocacy platform is really really important. So we will keep you guys updated about that as we move along. Um, the other thing <coughs> I wanted to just mention really quickly before we I get it, um, to introduce our guest speaker is our data work group has been working super, super hard. Everybody's been working really hard, but they were working a little bit overtime um, because we 
have been trying to narrow down uh, a consultant to help us with, I think the part that, that has probably been the most integral in terms of all the work groups, all three work groups, and the work of Healy in general is this idea about data. Like, it keeps coming up, people, you know, there's, there's questions about privacy, there's questions about how this infrastructure could work, there's questions about can we even do this, does this exist, which also leads into our guest speaker. Um, and so the data work, work group, um, you know, we ended up having a combined call with the steering committee and the data work group um, for our final two candidates for the data consultant. They're both excellent organizations and really well qualified and we're sort of at the final stages now of making a recommendation to the steering committee. So that work is gonna be getting up and running and really trying to, we're gonna really try to move that along because we don't have a tremendous amount of time till the, till the grant ends. So I'm very, very excited about that. Um, so I think that's it. Does anybody have any questions or concerns before we move on? Everybody's good? Okay. So um, I want to welcome and introduce to all of you Kim Birdsall. Um, it's very funny because I did a webinar that we shared with all of you. I think it was back in November. It was hosted by, I had to go back in my emails and remember you know, who hosted the webinar. But it was, um, the, the webinar was Community Care Coordination Systems Levering, Leveraging Technology to Close the Loop. And I don't know if anybody else here had a chance to jump on that one, but Kim was one of the panelists on the webinar. It was sponsored by the Public Health Institute through their Dialogue for Health. And so I listened and I was very excited to hear about, they, they, they showcased, I think there were three different folks and they showcased different kinds of community care coordination projects that were happening across the country. But something about Kim and what she was talking about in terms of the work that they're doing in Passaic really kind of you know, stuck in my brain. So I reached out to her and we ended up having a call that I thought would last maybe about 15, 20 minutes. You know, one of those calls was like, oh, you were doing this. We ended up staying on the phone, I think, for about an hour and a half. Right. So watch out, I can talk. Because <laughs> <laughs> I can't talk, right? <laughs> um, but what I was so excited about was all the, the pieces that we've been kind of building upon and working towards as an alliance. And some of the things that in the very beginning, if we go back to our first meeting last, I don't even know, was it March or April, and nobody really understood, like, well, what is it that we're actually doing? They're doing in Passaic, and it's, and, it's, and as I've said many times, it's happening all over the country, but it's really looking at, um, and Kim's going to describe for you much more about their work, but it's, it's all those pieces that we keep talking about, right? Care coordination in communities, um, finding some kind of a data infrastructure and a, and a platform to make sure that that data is being shared appropriately and equitably, and you know, bringing in together into the table or to the table multiple partners. So community, community-based organizations, healthcare providers. Um, who else is in your coalition? Well, hopefully, uh, managed care organizations. Managed care organizations. <laughs> so I just thought, and and and, you know, Kim does work in for a hospital system indirectly, but her her project is is funded by a private foundation, and she'll go through it more. But um, and a lot of the population that, um, that, and the concerns that are being addressed are very similar to some of our deepest pockets of need. Um, and so I just thought, let's get her in and have her talk to our alliance, because better that you hear from somebody else that's actually doing this than from me telling you that we can do it. So I am going to introduce Kim. I'm going to read a little bit, because it's, you have her bio in front of you. But she is the executive director of the Health Coalition of Passaic County. And she provides the strategic direction and is responsible for the day-to-day -day management of basically everything that the coalition does. Um, and she has an extensive background in public health and health care and community service. So I think you're going to fall in love with her as much as I did because I just was like, you have to come. So with that, I'm going to introduce Kim and turn the mic over to her. Thank you. You're very welcome. So I'm not going to be stuck behind the podium, but I will travel back and forth over there to kind of 
um, transition for a few slides, but first of all, I just want to thank all of you for opening up your doors and inviting me to come, and I hope that um, today can really be a conversational um, presentation and discussion so that any of the work that we've done can really help maybe inform or um, help you avoid any of the pitfalls that we've experienced so far, because really we're all in this together, so um, it's important to try to learn from each other. And we've had the benefit of, of having some great partners that have helped us avoid some pitfalls, so I'm happy to kind of pass that along. Um, Emily's been wonderful. We did, we had a great conversation after the webinar, and she shared with me a bit about the work here of Healy and um, your alliance and, and the aspect of things that you guys are coming to really meet the needs of, of the people that you serve, and I know that this is your planning year, right? So at the end of this year, your goal is to really kind of have a plan, right? <laughs> so, and a business model. And a business model, yeah. and, and um, this is not easy work. Uh, it has, um, I'm gonna show a slide that I think is a wonderful representative of sort of where we all are. But I wanted to start um, to really open it up to, to you all first, just if we can really, get to three to five things that you would like to be able to hear today that hopefully I can address either in the presentation or at Q&A after, but I'd, I'd love to just jot down um, three to five either topics or questions that you might have before we get started. Oh, come on. <laughs> I mean, it could be data, it could be community, it could be organizing, it could be certain population that you're trying to serve. Just. We can go with three, set the bar a little low. <laughs> How could uh, we develop the data so we can be marketable? Okay. Okay, one. Yeah. I think talk about outreach to the community, how we're going to let the community know what we're doing. Okay. Yeah. Two. Anybody on the phone? Well, oh. How you created a coalition between different types of providers, CBOs, health systems, NCOs, etc. Okay. All right, we're on a roll, so we have three. Anybody else? Yes. Oversight. I don't know. I don't know if anyone said this, but I, I'm hoping to see how people are measuring the impact of the work that they do on social determinants. That was Kathy, right? Yep. Okay. Okay. And can you also speak about any pitfalls in terms of the coalition building? I mean, we've done a lot of that work, but anything that came up in terms of pitfalls? Absolutely. Okay, so I have six. So um, data and how we can use that to be marketable, uh, community outreach, and maybe some experiences that we've had with that. Um, the coalition, how that was built among other providers. Oversight, who mentioned oversight? Could you just elaborate on that a little bit more? In terms of oversight and actually the, the Caller actually dovetailed the second half of that. You know, how do you collect the data? How do you prove your worth? How do you, how do you make a difference? Okay. And that immediately folds into me with uh, the how are you going to be sustainable? So right. we're going to give That's you this money. Word. Now, how are you going to be sustainable? Right. Okay. And then also measuring our work with the social determinants of health and talking about some of the pitfalls. So I think we'll. I think we'll cover all of that, but I wrote it down in my very messy um, scribble here, and we'll circle back at the end if for some reason I don't hit that. So um, this quote uh, that I really wanted to start today with was, can't be attributable to anyone. Um, I had the pleasure of serving in Bergen County on a board that was tasked with oversight of a hospital, um, and it was really a public-private partnership. There was a management company for that hospital, and the contract was ending, and so I was on the team that was really looking at what the future of this organization was going to be. Um, and certainly lots of political differences, uh, whether it should be sold, and long story short is we were able to develop a strategic plan and put together um, kind of a coalition of different organizations that actually won the contract. And at the opening and the discussion and the launch of that program, somebody stood up and said, if you're lucky, once in your lifetime, you get to do, you get an opportunity to do something great, and this is great. And I think that it, it goes toward what we're all trying to do. It doesn't mean it's easy, but I think keeping our eye on the ball and being motivated by the fact that what we are trying to build here is great, even if we don't see the end result, um, is something that is just sort of inspiring. So I wanted to share that with you. Uh, I think that there's a true power in alliance, in true alliance, in building up, breaking down those silos and building up those bridges to connect one another. And so I wanted to hopefully share with you today how we started as a coalition, 
uh, where our strengths have been and what some lessons we've learned, and then also maybe an idea of where we're going. But this is my favorite slide, um, because I think it represents a lot <laughs> about life, about coalition building, certainly about where we have been, and I'm not sure where you might fall on this road, um, but maybe where you are. So I think, you know, sometimes we are even off the page. Um, I like to look at this with areas that have represented a light, right, points of light, points of successes, points that might be a little bit darker or failure, um, certainly long, windy twists, turns, but ultimately, you know, up at the top up there is that ultimate destination, right, being something great, um, and how do we achieve that? So. This is an actual road in Romania, believe it or not. Um, I don't know if it's on my bucket list to get there one day, but I do think it's, uh, it's certainly representative of the journey. And I'm glad that there were a few laughs, um, because maybe you're feeling what I'm feeling. I'll be honest with you, yesterday I think I was, I don't, even, I don't know, I was on a different mountain yesterday. Um, so I'm hoping that that will not affect our conversation today. So as Emily said, um, this is the Health Coalition of Passaic County is who I represent, and you know, don't be bored by looking at that. I wanted to kind of just really share with you, without visuals, um, why we were built and sort of how we got here. So, all under the framework of social determinants of health. Health has finally realized that health is about more than just going to the doctor, that health involves all community partners, that um, true wellness certainly involves um, a holistic approach, and that we need the right people around the table, right? So I always say that um, our goal is to be the bridge between clinical and community. And so we approached it from a clinical to community. I know you all are really approaching it from a community to a clinical, but we're still kind of in the same, in the same road. So what happened in the state of New Jersey um, back in, I wanna say, let's see, I started in 2017. So let's say like 2013-ish, um, the state of New Jersey decided that they were going to do a Medicaid ACO demonstration project. So they put out uh, a notification and communities could apply to become certified Medicaid ACOs. Meaning that it was a clinical focus, it would be a gain sharing model, you know, how do we better manage folks who are on Medicaid to get them the care that they need. And one example that I'll point to um, out of Trenton, New Jersey, which is one of our, we work very closely with, um, once they got up and running and they, they looked at this data hot spotting, anybody familiar with hot spotting? Okay. So really built out of Dr. Jeffrey Brenner down in the Camden Coalition in New Jersey, taking a look at, um, when you look at the data, a very small percentage of people utilize a very large percentage of the healthcare dollar, and so how do we better coordinate care for those folks? Because many times it's not clinical needs. Um, the example out of Trenton, once they actually got an alliance together and started looking at some folks who were really utilizing the healthcare system at a very high level, they found one woman who had been to the hospital over 400 and something times in the course of one year meaning that she was visiting more than once a day, multiple hospitals within a close jurisdiction, and nobody was ever talking to one another. So obviously she had needs that were not necessarily clinical, maybe some of those, but a lot of social needs. So out of all of that, the state of New Jersey decided to do a certified Medicaid ACO demonstration project, and multiple folks applied. Three were certified, of which we were not one. Um, Camden, Newark and Trenton were all certified Medicaid ACOs. They received funding from the state of New Jersey for infrastructure, and they also received access to the Medicaid claims data. Does everyone know what an ACO is? Accountable Care Organization. So the idea behind it being that let's all manage these folks more effectively, and then we can actually all benefit, like right, community benefits as a whole, as well as some financial implications. So um, from our story, although we were not a certified Medicaid ACO, I would say it was a blessing and a curse because we didn't have the funding, but we did um, have the grant support of a foundation called the Nicholson Foundation. So the Nicholson Foundation saw the need in Passaic County and Patterson in particular and said we like the structure of the ACO, we would like you guys to launch, right, so you had less kind of restrictions, but we sort of had a model. So our objectives for our first year were based on that Medicaid ACO model, and we were tasked with 
pulling together a community coalition, first pulling together a board, um, developing a team, starting to look at who we could most serve most effectively based on the data that we did have access to in the community, um, choosing a care coordination model to most effectively meet the needs of those folks, and then looking at some tools that we could also put in place in order to do that. So I will say that the community-based organizations, which we call our CAB, Community Advisory Board members, um, the value of that and the value of those partnerships and the value of really helping to serve the needs of the target population um, cannot be overstated. I think that um, all of you guys sitting around the table talking to one another lends a tremendous amount of um, benefit to the, to the structure that you're trying to put in place. So I know it's a lot. It's a lot on that road. Um, I can come back to any of those sort of questions. But our first year, we found, uh, when I started, I started in February of 2017. Um, the board was already put in place, not a large board. We have grown to 17 members of our board of directors. And I was tasked with starting to pull together our community advisory board. The way that we did that was to go to our board of directors and say, who do you partner with already in the community? Who do you work with that is in the social services aspect? Who do you work with in housing? Who do you work with in transportation? Who do you work with that serves families or education? And so we relied on this core group of board members to help drive who else should be sitting around the table. Um, since that time, we've slowly grown and we're currently with 37 member organizations from a very diverse um, aspects of the community. Uh, currently, our main focus is Patterson, New Jersey, but we are going to grow to be broader than that to Passaic County as a well. whole. Um, we, as an organization, as, as the board, have a subcommittee to really talk about what is our goal, what is our, what is our mission, where do we want to go to, and so this very broad mission was created that our goal was to have a thriving and sustainable community coalition that is dedicated to improving the health and overall quality of life for residents of the greater Passaic County area by specifically addressing the social determinants of health really rolls off your tongue, it's a great <laughs> elevator speech, but basically we want to have a group of people that are going to work together to lift up the community, however we can do that, right? Um, what's that saying? Uh, a rising tide lifts all boats. So um, reaching out to the folks who are most in need, identifying who they are, and figuring out a way to use the resources that we all already have more effectively. Um, I look at uh, Patterson in particular has over 450 nonprofit organizations within the community itself. Um, there's a significant amount of need. I'll share with you a little bit about um, the issues in Patterson. Significant amount of need in the community. Significant amount of resources. So if they're operating effectively, why is there still so much need, right? And having a neutral organization, um, a coalition of people who are willing to kind of break down their silos and talk about what they do well and what they need help with, you know, is only going to benefit benefit everyone, um, and hopefully help us meet this very broad and complicated mission. So, uh, really, truly, thanks to the Nicholson Foundation, we got started, um, built that that board of directors. We are staying at 17. I've never had more bosses in my life. Um, so, 17 board members that encompass the. Main healthcare system, which is St. Joseph's and Patterson, also St. Mary's and Passaic. Uh, we have representation from one of the major um, managed care organizations in New Jersey. Uh, we have the head of housing on the board. We have the head of local health and county level health. Uh, we have two representatives from community um, development corporations that serve families. We have uh, represent representatives from education. Now, I didn't bring the whole list, but just so you know, as is your diverse group sitting around this table, the board that's leading the charge for the work that I do is diverse, and then it's even more diverse when we trickle down to the community advisory board level. Our goal um, is to build our community advisory board to 50 organizations by the end of our current grant cycle, which is the end of March. So we are continuing to expand. And our ultimate goal, as I said, is to really be that bridge between clinical and community. So we need to have our community resources. We need to have a diverse group because we have a diverse amount of needs. Um, the Nicholson first year grant wanted us to look at high utilizers. 
So we really were able to partner very closely with St. Joseph's Health. We looked at their data. We looked at who was utilizing the healthcare system that could be coordinated more effectively. Um, differing from Trenton that had four hospital systems in a very close geographic location so people could hospital hop, Patterson is different. This is really primarily the main healthcare institution. So we felt pretty confident in utilizing just their data to kind of take a, a look at, at where we can start. Um, so that was our, our really our first area. Uh, we chose, we certainly hired a population health analyst to dive into the data, took a look at, at who we could best coordinate. And then the next step was to say, great, so now we know who we want to serve, but how are we going to serve them? Um, and so we did a lot of due diligence to look at care coordination models that exist around the country. Uh, we held conference calls with different organizations to take some lessons from what they've learned. And we settled on what's called the Pathways Community Hub Model. So I'm just going to interrupt you for one second. So if you guys all remember the folks from the Brooklyn Perinatal Network that were here talking about the project they're working on, they're doing Pathways Hub also. So that was the same model. And the reason why we chose the Pathways Community Hub Model, which I'm not going to get into the specifics of all the pathways, but in a nutshell, there are 20 nationally recognized pathways that this model utilizes. And it talks about it's things that are clinical, like medical home and insurance, but it's also education, it's employment, it is social services. And the, the benefit of this model that we have found is it allows um, our community health worker who is working directly with clients to have a structure to be able to measure what the needs are that are identified and how we are doing in the process to meet those needs. Um, so for instance, if we are working with a client who identifies the fact that, um, let me pick a pathway, uh, that they ha are food insecure, right? So there's a pathway for food insecurity. We can identify that, we can mark when we activate that pathway and work with that client to find how we can make them more food secure. That's where our community-based organizations come in, right? Because part of our alliance is to make sure that we have food pantries that are um, involved in, in our work, that are providing a high level of and quality of services to their clients as well. So um, we would walk along the pathway with that client, you're food insecure, let's find a local organization that we work with, let's connect you there, let's make sure you have all your papers that are completed, let's make sure you know who to work with, and let's get you kind of on the road to becoming more food secure. Um, which, of course, one connection to a food pantry doesn't do that, but it's a start. And we're able to measure when that pathway is open, and we're able to measure when that pathway is completed. What we're also able to measure is when a pathway is open, like housing, which is a significant need for the folks that we're serving, um, and not just lack of housing, but also unstable or unsafe housing or unhealthy housing. So we, for instance, are working with a, a gentleman who, um, was identified because he was asthmatic, uh, which was part of our target population. And so he engaged in the programs that he wanted to be a part of this and would go and do a home visit, do medication assessment. This gentleman knows everything he's supposed to take, has a bucket full of medication, dumps it out, I take this, this, blah, 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 blah. But he's living in a moldy basement, probably a legal apartment, but it's what he can afford. No matter what other services you provide, unless the housing issue is addressed, you're not going to have a positive impact on the management of that chronic condition. Um, so that housing pathway would be activated for that individual. Although he's stably housed, he has a place to go, it's not a healthy housing situation. The challenge and the frustration um, with a, a, a pathway such as housing is it's really hard to close. <laughs> so we have, and I'll show you some stats as we get a little bit further, we have a lot of folks that need housing and we haven't been able to close that pathway for many individuals. We have a lot of partners that are around the table that work in the housing realm, but there's a lot of bureaucracy and lists and high level of need and a lot of challenges on that winding road to actually be able to achieve housing. The benefit of that, I think the benefit of measuring and knowing where the need is and where we're able to close the gap and not, is how do we take that information to start to drive policy change? How do we take that information to start to 
talk to partners about saying that it's great that we have these resources, but if they're not able to be accessed, how can we do better? How can we take the information to inform? And I think people know these things already, but having that tangible data to be able to prove it certainly speaks um, speaks a little bit more in volume. So um, I love this little three uh, bullet thing here. I don't know if you can see all of them, but the red bubble is data analysis. This is one of our strengths of the health coalition of Passaic County and these other coalitions, um, I think, in the state of New Jersey. It's one of our commonalities is that we're looking at the data, um, that we're using that to kind of drive where we want to go. The green bucket over there is community unification. Um, some of our, our partner organizations will say that they, they convene the community around whatever that data issue is. I say we want to drive to unify the community around what that <coughs> issue is. Um, what is the data showing us and how can we use our partners to unify around that project? And then the blue bubble that I'm sorry you can't see is um, program innovation. So it's data is a strength, getting the right community partners around the table, and then what are some programs that we can be innovative in utilizing to meet those needs? And for us, our current situation, I would say our innovative strengths are using the pathways model, um, working directly with community health worker who can hold the hands of these folks that truly are in most need um, and to use a term that I've heard, I'm not sure if you have, but are on the margins, right? Folks who have, who have been so disenfranchised by the, the way the system works um, that they really, they can't do it themselves. They need somebody to walk with them on this process. So um, community health worker, and finally, a, a new tool that we're pulling in to be able to manage all this better is a platform called NowPow, um, which is a closed loop referral technology platform. Um, what NowPow is allowing us to do is take all of our community partners and get them on a system. So we're able to pull them onto almost like a, a, a asset mapping approach, right? There's 450 nonprofits in Patterson. Nobody knows what each other does. Nobody knows each other exists. But if we as a coalition can start to really build and recognize, number one, what one another do in the community, but also have a tool that can help us fine tune the needs and map to those organizations, that's just beneficial for everyone. So uh, we have pulled on NowPow. It's gonna serve two purposes for us. The first is to build that community resource directory. And the second will be to um, do a closed loop referral technology. So the folks that we refer through our pathways out to our partners, our partners will be able to say, hey, we received this and this person didn't show up. Or hey, we received this person at the food pantry and they're all set and we're good to go. And so it's this closed loop referral technology as opposed to the referral vortex that many times I think we all live in, right? You know, you met with Jane Doe, Jane needs this, Jane here, call this person and you'll be on your way and you never hear from Jane again or do you know whatever happened to Jane. So we wanna to try to um, drive a little bit better. I'm gonna pause for a second because it's a lot of information. Does anybody have questions at this point? So. so we've mentioned, NowPow is one of the platforms that we've mentioned, right? So as we're in this process with, you know, once, once we start to engage with our data consultant and we start to really look at assessing our alliance and our members of the consortium and looking what folks have, it, it doesn't necessarily mean that NowPow is going to be where we're going because we don't know that, but it's certainly our partners at Northwell are working with NowPow. It's certainly something that's prominent in New York. It's certainly something... That, and what I what I was intrigued by was, um, and we asked, and maybe can can speak to this maybe a little bit later is how now Powell worked with the Pathways Hub. So Pathways Hub is a very specific kind of model for care coordination and service delivery, right? And how did now Powell adapt to be able to work with that? So again, it's 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 an example of something that could work for us. Not saying that it's going to be where we're going, but it's something that is a possibility. I think that's really important. And, you know, the way that I, that I don't know. The way that I look at it is NowPow is really just a tool. Um, it's a tool that we were able to pull forward that would meet our needs, and you hit the nail on the head as to why that was the case. Um, after we chose our target population and we chose our care coordination model, the Pathways model, we said, okay, this is great. How can we really manage this most effectively? 
and we started to look at potential options for different platforms to do that. Um, it took a while, and we got started with our, our in-client hair coordination before we had the NowHow tool. Um, you know, some rudimentary pen and paper. We, we had our intake form that we were going to utilize based on the pathways model. Based on the answers to those questions, it will trigger what the needs are for individuals. So we were really manually tracking and measuring and reporting on all of that information um, and have just recently been able to really complete the integration with NowPow. So what we found, um, why we chose NowPow was there are different options. There's other, uh, I think Aunt Bertha also presented on the, on the call on the New Wars conference. Um, and I think they're all really based on the same issue, kind of community asset mapping. There's tons of resources out there that exist. There's people who need those resources, and more likely than not, they fall between the cracks. So how can we use technology to, to, to catch them? Um, what we found beneficial with NowPow was they sat down with us, and they were willing to work with us to integrate the Pathways model into their current technology. So right now, they have, um, like I get all, I'm not that much of a uh, tech person, so forgive me if I'm, if you are and I'm using the wrong wording, but you know, they have a certain methodology that they utilize for their platform and it doesn't, it, does, it, it matches the pathways, but it wasn't built on pathways. So we took about this, this last year to sit down with them and say, this is how we're doing it. How can we make everything seamless and how can we use your, your technology to speak? So they integrated our intake form so when we do a screening, we can now do everything on the NowPow platform. We sit down with a the client, they say I'm interested in participating, they sign consent, and we go through our questions and answers, and it will now automatically trigger those pathways as opposed to us having to look back and do it um, manually. So it'll automatically say, based on Jane Doe's answers, she has a housing need, she has a food security need, she has um, child care need, It'll be, be identified in the platform, and then the back end of that platform has all of our community resource members in there. So she has a need for housing, and housing A, B, C, D is in her area, and she meets the criteria for whatever that may be. And um, child care A, B, C, D is in her area. So we'll be able to have what's called a healthy Rx specific to those clients, um, not based just on, okay, if you need housing, here's your list for housing. If you need childcare, here's your list for childcare. It'll pull up geographically like the top two or three. Um, and we're also able to prioritize the ones that we've worked well with. So we are not there yet. We are nowhere near that light at the end of the road, but we're slowly starting to build the resource directory and match it to the needs of our clients and then be able to measure, um, measure all of that. Yes. Sure. So how many clients do you do you service? So I'll get I'll get okay. a little bit into that. And we are still new. We started care coordination November first of twenty seventeen. So we just have about a year's worth of data to be able to show where we have been the most successful and where we may have the opportunity to be more successful. Um, one of our challenges is that again we went clinical to community, but we cast a very wide net in choosing to serve um, one of our, our one target population is the top three to five percent of the high utilizers of the healthcare system. Uh, lesson learned from other coalitions that went to the top one to two percent, really difficult to affect behavior change for the, the lots of issues, right? And so we certainly realize behavioral health and addiction and um, and housing and other complex issues are in that top three to five percent, but we thought perhaps if we went down a little bit further, we would be able to maybe make a little bit more inroads. We're now at the point that we want to see what did we do with those folks, and were we more successful with folks who maybe had a chronic condition, or folks from a certain zip code, or did we able were we able to close the loop for everyone who needed housing, which I'll tell you we did not, um, so that we can better inform our next year. So I do have stats for that too. Yes. Um, can you tell us? <clears throat> how many community organizations you're working with? So right now um, we have 37 plus 17, so 54, <coughs> um, that are around the table. 
but our resource directory and now pound other things will extend beyond that. But this is our really our core group, and then we, we hope to, to continue to build. So when you said it took us some time, what was that time? Time to build the organization. So I started in February of 2017, so I'll be coming up on my second year. Um, I think we were able to get probably about 35 organizations around the table re relatively quickly. Um, and, and because I think people understand the fact that, you know, the time has come that we need to break down these walls and really talk to each other, and that there's a lot of benefits in that. And just given the objectives and the grants and, and the rest of that crazy road, uh, we probably could have built even more even quicker, but I needed to kind of slow slow, the, slow down a little bit. Um, it's actually a little bit of a comment for this group on dovetailing on what uh, Emily was saying about NAPAL. I'm Nat, I work for Northwell. We're making a major investment in NAPAL uh, to bring it to Long Island. So. Um, we're actually going to be building the community resource directory for Long Island, incorporating hopefully all of the CBOs in here. Um, as Emily mentioned, it's, it's not necessarily going to be the end-all solution for you all to receive referrals, um, but it's probably going to be our major solution to send referrals. So how we integrate it with the folks in this, uh, representing um, this organization, these organizations, we have to decide and figure out with you all. But, from our perspective at Northwell, NAPAL is going to be our method for sending out referrals and um, building the database. And I think one of the benefits, you know, we're in the phase now that we don't want to interfere or reimagine the workflows of our community based organizations, right? Because you all receive things a certain way. And so, how do we work with those tools as sending that we can not be intrusive, but that we can actually be able to close the loop on those referrals? Um, and I think that's, that's critical to the so when you're doing that initial screening for the needs of the person, are, so it's a two-part question, are you looking at the needs of their entire family, and are you screening any children um, for um, developmental delays or trauma, and, and how do you deal with them, the different people within that family? So there is a de developmental pathway um, for the Pathways Hub, and we do ask about number of children. Um, I can't say that just because our target population Right now, we haven't really had to have gone into that realm much, but I do think that we have the capabilities to do that and can add on additional questions for the screening. So, um. and one of the things we've been gathering, and I think we even asked uh, folks in the room, you know, we're trying to look at a screening tool that is all encompassing in that way, Jen. So, you know, we have a bunch of examples that we've been collecting, and as we move there, you know, to, to look at what what kinds of questions and uniformly could we get to a place where we're asking the same questions. <coughs> um, um, and the other thing that I wanted to, and I'm gonna have, it was in my brain and now it's out of my brain. It was <laughs> along the lines of what both of you just said. Um, oh, I'll just have to think about it and come back to it, sorry. Well, if I can just build on that, if we already have a system such as Help Me Grow, which is doing the screening mm -hmm. for children, how do you work with other coalitions that maybe have a different target population but are basically doing the same work. So it's interesting specifically with Help Me Grow, which I'm not as familiar with yet, but um, that is actually on the Pathways model for the developmental. It's one of the, it's, it's one of the points is Help Me Grow. Um, I think too that, now see something's gonna go out, it's contagious, something's gonna go out of my brain. Um, <laughs> Oh, but it goes back to our intake and our process right now. We, we try to adhere very closely to the Pathways Community Hub model um, that's, that's out there in the public space. And, and there's an opportunity. They have what's called certified community hubs. Um, and my understanding, and I still have to dig a little deeper, was at one point, if you were a certified Pathway Community Hub, you were able to... Um, to bill back to Medicaid for pathway completion. There was a reimbursable uh, component to that. My understanding is that's kind of on pause just based on the landscape of, of things, but we wanted to be in a position that if that channel opens again, that we are able to adhere to the model so that we could go for certification. So I think you can add additional screens on, but for us right now, we just, we're trying to be pretty um, conservative in, in the approach that we're taking. I mean, I, I also think that as we move <coughs> ahead, that's, the, the conversations of how we integrate what already exists 
with what we're, you know, we're not trying to reinvent the wheel here and it doesn't make sense to, you know, to do something that already is there. So that's going to be something that is, once we hire the data consultant and they start to do their assessments and, you know, start to take stock of what exists on Long Island, that's going to be have to be a piece of that, right? Because they're, you know, we have the two on one, we have Help Me Grow, so how does that all integrate together? <clears throat> With that, so does your data go into your local health information exchanges? So uh, for the other organization, the other ones that are further along than us, they all have regional HIEs. They've contracted with um, you know, I want a vendor to be able to stand that up. We are a little bit behind, and because of our funding, we chose to go with the NowPow build and then see where the, the HIE component was going to fill in because we are primarily working with St. Joe's. Um, the state of New Jersey is moving towards a health information network on a so so I think that in a, in one way we're in a good space to sort of see how this is going to all play out. Um, but ultimately, I would like to drive to have a regional HIE that we can have all the hospitals put their data, the state Medicaid data, the social service organizations, and connect that right out to NowPow. So um, that's really far down that road and probably off the map. Of I just wanted to also share with you, so, you know, that high utilizer was our first year of the grant from the Nicholson Foundation, um, and they're a wonderful funder, but for year two, they said, that's great that you did all that, but, you know, we've had the Medicaid ACO demonstration project, we're still trying to see if that's successful. We want you to choose another population health issue, and we know preterm birth rates are really very high in Patterson, Pacific County, nationally, infant mortality, so we were lucky enough to really be working on two projects right now. We're still doing the high utilizers, and we also um, started to really kind of do some planning and, and look into the preterm birth rate issue. Um, and also we were uh, given a grant to do an in-home pediatric asthma project. So for that project, we are working with families, um, community health worker going into the home. It is based on the, the Kruger method, so it's more of a protocol uh, where they'll have three home visits and a six-month follow-up call go in, do an environmental assessment um, to see if, we're not using now pal for, or pathways for that in-home pediatric asthma, it's its own structure. The idea of that grant is to be able to make the case to managed care organizations that mitigating triggers in the home with like dust mite proof mattress covers, HEPA filter vacuums, et cetera, has a very positive <laughs> impact on um, utilization and that those things should be co covered by insurance. So we're in the process of you go in, you assess, the next visit you bring what's ever going to mitigate the trigger, you go back, do another assessment, and we see if we've been able to make a positive impact. And we recently were just funded um, by the Henry and Marilyn Taub Foundation to do a project that we're calling Pathways to Success for Seniors. We're using our same model of a, a target population. We'll bring them into the Pathways Community Hub model. We'll connect them to NowPow. The overall goal for this project is to prevent seniors from falls, <coughs> um, knowing that uh, falls certainly are an area that then kind of have a cycle effect after that. So in that model, we'll be doing an in-home environmental assessment and be trying to connect for, let's say, if there's railings that need to be, be fixed or stairs or, or carpets or lighting or other things. So it's a little bit different, but um, it's kind of combining both. I really went off on a major tangent. No, but you've been addressing what the questions are. <laughs> so I wanted to give you a very brief overview because I know that you said that maybe there's some similarities in the clients that we're trying to serve. So I just want to share a little bit about Passaic County and Patterson in particular. Um, Passaic County ranks 15th out of 21 counties in New Jersey for health-related behaviors and 17th out of 21 for um, socioeconomic factors. So issues that have very high rates compared to the rest of the state include obesity, adult obesity, um, sexually transmitted infections, teen births, smoking, alcohol impaired uh, driving deaths, very high rates of unemployment, children in poverty, single children, uh, children in single parent household, violent crime, social associations. And so um, certainly the community health needs assessments are done at a county level and St. Joseph's, which is Southern Passaic County, really covers more of Patterson, which is really an area of need, did their community health needs assessment, and there's a myriad of needs that were identified, but their priorities were for nutrition, physical activity, and weight, and heart disease, stroke, and diabetes. So um, 
just to put this in context, Patterson has actually identified 52 distinct ethnic groups within its borders. 61% of people in the community speak a language other than English. 57.6% uh, of the population is comprised of Hispanic or Latinos of any race. Um, the largest ethnic, it's also the largest ethnic group. Other significant groups include Bangladeshi, Turkish, Arab, Palestinian, Albanian, Dominican, Peruvian. Um, the Muslim population is estimated at 25 to 30,000. Racially, the city is about 32% uh, African American, 35% white, 3.4% Asian, um, and 24% of the residents consider themselves from other races. So it's a very diverse community, not to bore you with numbers, but I think just so you can, yes. Hey, just on that, what was the, do you know the number of immigrants in the community? Or I don't, um, but uh, I know it's the second most densely populated city in the state of New Jersey. Um, and I will say that the immigrant population has had a significant impact on some of the work that we're trying to do. Um, and we are relating a lot of that to the climate of fear, um, particularly in our in-home pediatric asthma project. Um, you know, we're, we're having a, a very difficult time that folks don't want people to be in their homes. Um, they don't really want to be on the radar for anything. So. How do you include immigrants in the uh, process that you're involved? So one of the things that's great about St. Joe's um, is that it certainly has a very high level of, of charity care. It's a, the, the hospital itself is established and its mission is to serve the underserved, so um, regardless of regardless of status. So, but you know, it's one of those those issues that the community as a whole is working on, and the census um, is currently underway as well in Patterson. So. I can't give you more really probably information than that, but I can find out for you after. Uh, we have a ridiculously lean team, and I don't mean physically, I'm not running any races with, um, <laughs> with beer at the end or not. Um, but, <clears throat> so it's myself, uh, and then we really have three main players on this team, along with an alliance of partners in the community. Uh, we have, uh, David Asiyama, he's the Director of Clinical and Community Engagement. He really oversees the work of the community health worker, does a lot of the measurements of the pathways model, and, and works in coordination with our population health analyst, who is out there to um, really see where we're gonna go next, where we have been successful. And then Angela Smith is our community health worker. She is our, our sole beginning community health worker, but we're currently expanding. We've just brought on um, a new community health worker as well. And we're looking to launch probably um, really multiply that a lot in the coming year. So I did bring some slides that specifically speak to our current projects and sort of what we're seeing. I don't want to bore you with those, but would you like me to kind of go into yes? Okay. So when we looked at our target population, our grant tasked us with actually choosing two two subsets, and so we chose uh, the top three to five percent of the emergency department utilization as well as the second target population was men ages 40 to 64 with asthma, COPD, or diabetes. Um, the idea behind that second population was that looking at the data, we made an, an inference that um, these are folks who tend to fall off the radar for healthcare, and then they just show back up when they actually have something that's really exacerbated. So how could we really do some better care coordination for that, that population? Um, and more because their length of stay was longer than because they're so here's our two target populations, um, and this gets to where we are as far as our client enrollment. <clears throat> uh, we currently have, actually this is old data, this was as of September, we have 58 clients enrolled, we've added on another 10, so we're up to 68 that we're currently working with. Um, all of those fall under the purview of our community health worker, but, but we've moved folks to inactive or graduated, so we're trying to make sure that she's not overburdened or we're looking to you know, up our number of we take a look here at um, how many have been flagged. Our benefit with, with working directly with the hospital system is we know who we would like to serve, and so we're able to actually flag those folks, and when they hit the system, we can engage with them and ask them if they're interested in participating in this new program or not. If they are, they sign consent so that we're able to work on their behalf with community partners, we're able to talk about data, we're able to, to work in a coordinated effort. 
So we flagged a total of 170 individuals. 130 of those had touched the system, which is 76%. Um, we were able to enroll successfully 58. So we have 45% of folks who touch the system have enrolled in our program. Um, there are folks that might touch after hours or that, that they touch and they leave before we're able to get there. So this is something that we're working to improve upon. 12 individuals declined when they were approached and so a total of 9% declined. One of our key measures is engagement. Uh, the pathways model really requires that not only do you work on the client's behalf, but that the client works in partnership with you. And I think that that goes not just from our side, but also from a community-based organization side, um, so that they're ultimately able to put themselves in a better, a better place. And so we measure engagement, meaning how many times have we tried to reach out to the client and how many times have we connected with them, um, including you know, losing them to follow up or folks moving, et cetera. One of the things that you know, we really like to highlight is our engagement score, the significant increase once we had our full-time community health worker put in place, and I think goes to the value of that position as a whole. Um, really on a national level, I would love to see community health workers be standardly certified, and because having the voice of folks who are from the community to know about the community, and to work with people who are struggling in the community, I don't think you can really you know, put a value on that if there's a tremendous value there. Um, we have uh, this again this is engagement score what's interesting is our target population too so the folks with more chronic conditions had a slightly higher engagement score um, our homeless folks had a very high engagement score 80, 80. Um, so uh, and then we took a look at diagnostic cohorts is there a, a group of folks that have a certain diagnostic cohort that has a higher engagement rate and diabetes actually rose to the surface as, as the highest one so we're, we're, you know, we're buzzing around. Do we say that you know, we want to move forward next year into working specifically with folks who have diabetes because we've also been able to really, um, I think, show a potential reduction um, in utilization for that population. This is very preliminary analysis. It's also based on the fact that we haven't had a full year's worth of data for all the folks that we're serving. So there is some uh, projection, it's a projected, but we took a look at in 2016, how many ED visits did our folks who we're working with have, and, and have we moved that needle at all moving forward? And we are projecting about a 25% overall reduction in ED utilization for the folks that we're trying to, to work with. Very preliminary, um, we're deep, digging in a little bit deeper, seeing who exactly and what pathways were associated with those individuals that we can maybe make some inferences from. Uh, I'm just going to drop Kim for one second. So I just want to remind folks, specific, specifically folks from smaller community-based organizations, remember that behind all of this, right, this grant and the work is the goal of the state is to reduce avoidable hospitalizations, right, to reduce health care costs. And we have to just keep that in mind, that, that while that may not be our goal strictly as community-based organizations and as a coalition, that is... So if we can continue to make the case for what we know, right, is that when people's basic needs are met, as Kim was speaking about earlier, like when you live in safe housing, in safe communities, have access to quality childcare, you live in a violent-free neighborhood, in a violent-free home, and you can go to work and you have trans when all those things are happening, the likelihood is that what? You're not gonna end up in the hospital. You're not gonna be as sick as you would have been otherwise. So I just wanna remind you that sometimes it gets, and it happens to me too, like we forget that, you know, the, the, it may not be our goal, boots on the ground, grassroots, to reduce ED visits, although that may be part of it, but that certainly is the goal of the, the state through this whole Medicaid redesign project and that managed care organizations we know are not, we don't believe anyway, just from everything we've seen and talked to, they're not going to be looking to just you know, contract with one community-based organization at a time. So the value of all of us at the table, regardless of how you serve community, so even if you don't see that, like, I, I don't work in, you know, in, in medical, I don't work with asthma or whatever, it doesn't matter. Because if we are lurking, looking at investing in communities, upfront dollars to invest in communities, to make people healthier and to rise communities up, then we, every single person in this coalition who is not here at the table today, 
does have value to this and does have a voice and does have a, so I just want to bring you back to where we all started because I know sometimes in, in and, and we have <coughs> healthcare partners that we're working with Northwell is a very very good partner of ours and we're all trying to figure this out but remember from the grassroots level the value that we have is that we're already in communities serving folks at the, the where they live and where they are so I just I just want to I think that that's really important to just put back to all of you sorry for the interruption. no I think that's an incredibly valid and a point that does bring it back to what it is to be great right what we're ultimately trying to strive for um, and and get out of our little silos which we all exist in and and that's not easy right there's a lot of, of um, uh, what do I want to say uh, there's a lot of things that people aren't necessarily willing to share building that trust among partners and really truly working as partners to, to remember why we're all in this to begin with right is to make to meet those social determinants of health um, I certainly didn't go into public health because I I thought that you know it would be very uh, financially beneficial I mean you go into it to serve um, and, and I love that saying that a rising tide lifts all boats because we're only as we're only as strong as our weakest link, right, in, in these communities. Um, but the value also, to me personally, and uh, I want to put on the parking lot um, an issue that you just raised about the funding and about the alliance. So remind me. Okay. Um, but I think one of the values is at the end of the day. You don't want to be an organization that comes in and lifts up a community. You want the community to lift themselves, right? And so how do you work with those organizations that already exist and the community itself? That's why I think the community health worker from the community as a, as a workforce development tool, working on all aspects with, with clients, with that pathways or whatever other tool is selected, um, is really going to ultimately be very beneficial. Now, it's a long way to get there, but that's my soapbox. So I wanted to, um, the value of the community coalitions, and, and we are not there yet, but I will speak about the Trenton Health Team in those three buckets, right? We all tend to be a little bit stronger, I think, in one area than the other. Uh, for the HCPC, I think our program innovation is really kind of our strength right now. We certainly do data and community. But the Trenton Health Team has been able to bring tremendous amount of funding into the community because of the alliance around the table. Um, and because of the, the fact that they are a neutral convener so that um, and I think that that's really what the power is what you're trying to build here right as a neutral entity that can show that you can work together there's a lot of value in funders um, looking at those alliances and I think it's really the direction of the future so um, they recently I think got a build grant that talks about safe communities right if you want people to be out and, and address the obesity epidemic. You need to be able to have communities that people feel safe and going out and walking and exercising and, you know, uh, and, and whether they are considered safe or perceived as safe or not safe really is, is an important tool. And then how do you communicate out with the, to the community about those resources? Okay, um, so this might be a little bit more interesting, or, or hopefully this is all interesting, but a little bit more uh, directed towards your organization. So this is where we are right now, with, uh, or back in September, with the number of pathways that we initiated and how many we completed. And I think each of you around the table probably falls under the heading of one or more of these pathways. This is not all 20, um, but behavioral health. It's a very broad pathway underneath that. It talks about addiction, it talks about, you know, um, uh, as well as like depression, clinical behavioral health, kind of diagnosis broad pathway, significant need within the community, um, and we haven't been able to complete many of those, uh, which speaks also to the housing issue, right? So behavioral health, I'm sorry? I'm just coughing. Oh, um, I, <laughs> and we're still looking really, so the behavioral health pathway itself requires you to be able to have three visits with a behavioral health therapist before that pathway is considered completed. So it takes a bit longer to complete, that's one factor. The other is in the community of Patterson, you know, do we need to look at the resources that are available to address the needs of clients? And I will tell you that one of the things we're learning is a lot of therapy, our group therapy sessions, right, especially for folks who are on Medicaid. Um, there is a, a tremendous hesitancy for some folks to participate in those therapy sessions because there may be court mandated folks that have to be there. They've been down this road before, they haven't gotten anything out of it. And in my mind, there is a, a connection and a lane here for the integration of telehealth. 
Um, we're not there yet, but down the road, you know, I think you're working, you're a community health worker engaging with an individual that has some depression issues, and you're able to then use technology to connect them to somebody that they can speak with, um, you know, I think is beneficial. I'm sure there's a tremendous amount of hurdle to get there, but I don't like to see an issue and not at least think through how we can figure out how to solve it. Um, employment, uh, we have nine total assigned. We were able to complete one. Um, this is interesting as well, right? Many times folks who, uh, and you probably know this better than I, um, folks who may say they're interested in employment once they realize that they actually would, it would actually remove some of the benefits that are, they're already receiving and would be more beneficial to remain unemployed. You know, there's not a lot of drive for the folks that we're working with right now to move forward on the employment pathway. Um, Health education, you know, we've had a good completion rate, but certainly it's something that we want to drive to be a little bit better with because I don't believe handing someone a flyer means that they've been educated. So we certainly are integrating um, some pre and post tests and looking at like videos that might exist online to be able to, if you have a asthma, that we can prove that maybe you, you know more now once um, that's completed. And the other ones are listed here. I highlight to you that uh, the ones in blue are the ones that we have a, a pretty high completion rate, at least over 50%. Um, the ones in red are ones that we certainly find the most challenging and I think are hand-in-hand behavioral health and housing. Questions? Do you work with a hospital when you do this? Yes. Because yes. we don't have a hospital where we are after Sandy. So I know he mentioned Northwell, but I'm just trying to figure out our findings, how we would work with that. We would have to go to another community then. Just looking at it. Anyway. So what organization do you work with? Long Beach Latino in Long Beach, and we don't have a hospital. We have only a WebMD, and we have some urgent cares. We are close to uh, South Nassau, but I know that people go to the medical center in East Meadow, which is not really um, reputable. I mean, it is, but some people just, the people that come to us do have a lot of complaints, and we, I, don't, I wouldn't know how to suggest the um, population and then the completion to, you know, educate them. It would, it would be kind of, it, it's making me feel like, you know, I, you have a, an upper hand and I don't, so I'm kind of wearing the crutches. But that's how we can all work together. To I know, so I'm trying to think how we could do that, yeah. right. Okay. Just, uh, just a comment on, the, you mentioned telehealth, and we actually, Northwell has a number of telehealth initiatives, might be a good solution in this case. Um, okay. For example, we have a behavioral health telehealth program, uh, kind of similar to what you mentioned. Uh, you're exploring in New Jersey. Um, we have we actually have what's called an EICU, which is staffed by physicians and experts that sit in a center and do all telehealth monitoring of patients in, in uh, other locations. So it's one of the solutions that we've proposed to address geographic challenges like yours in Long Beach. Okay, thank you. We should talk more about it. Okay. And you are well, we'll call it. Yeah. Okay. And I think if you're, you know, just from a personal standpoint, but if you're serving clients that do access a certain facility for their services, it would be beneficial to really work with that facility um, right. to, to try to address those needs. And I, I would expect beneficial for that facility as well because chances are they probably could have better care for coordination. Okay. So I can have multiple. Yeah, and we have I mean we have other members of the consortium mm -hmm. who are Long Beach based. So that's something else we should talk okay. about is, you know, and, and again, I think we're almost getting out in front of our skis right. a little bit at this point, but it's, you bring up some really important I points. just needed to see because once I saw that, I feel like I'm in kindergarten and, you know, everybody's already having that, um, that, you know, the, the, the area that we really need is, is the base is a hospital and we don't have that, which is, you know. Yeah. I think it's it's you know it's where your starting point is. Um, somebody told me yesterday it's where you came where your on ramp is, mm -hmm. right? And so um, I think it can be done either way. Yeah. If it's I mean it's like this alliance from the community. Your those folks are going to want to be. A it's part almost of seven that. years <coughs> since Sandy, so yeah. it's tough. Thank you. Sure. Um, I'd love to just give you some highlights of some of our other projects, and then we can talk more about questions. Does that that work, or do you want to do questions and then? I don't want to bore you. Um, okay. So uh, just because we didn't have enough to do, again, we got involved in the preterm birth rates. This is a major initiative in the state of New Jersey. 
Um, I'm sure you've all heard about infant mortality rates across the country. Specifically in New Jersey, the, the um, African American infant mortality rates um, are just horrendous, and so it's a major initiative of the state. And uh, we actually were given this grant to look at the preterm birth rates, which I think you can make a direct correlation to um, infant mortality before the state identified this as one of their priorities. So we were tasked with uh, really doing a data review and a analysis at the local level, but whatever we could have access to with Patterson and also Passaic County a little bit, um, to select a target population who, what zip codes, which women, what can we identify folks who are at highest risk for preterm birth rates based on historic data. So we took a look also at the state level data um, and some central intake and we've learned a lot about the process and I don't want to bore you with all of these charts but I think it's a really important issue for us on, us on a national level. Um, March of Dimes shows that the premature birth rate um, is, is above, it was a D. Uh, for Passaic County, and it was a, a C for New Jersey. Um, the average percent of live births in 2013 through 15, based on race and ethnicity, is listed here. There's a disparity ratio of 1.19, which shows no improvement from baseline. Um, among African American non Hispanic women, the low birth weight continues to be higher than other races, with no shown improvement. Uh, and then according to the state health data assessment in 2016, we took a look at um, the, the country, the state, the county, um, specifically in Passaic, African American, non-Hispanic, and then um, Hispanic. And so uh, you can see at the bottom there that Passaic County and black non-Hispanic moms are more likely to have preterm babies and less likely to have a first trimester prenatal care compared to New Jersey and the United States that the teen birth rate was twice as high in Passaic County, and that Passaic County um, moms have a higher rate of low risk cesarean births. So there's a lot of work to do um, in regard to you know, moving this and, and addressing this issue in regard to uh, where we are. Um, I think you know, a, a very uh, disturbing trend is that this preterm birth rate has continued to increase, and if you look at Passaic County, oops, if you look at New Jersey, right, and then you look at Passaic County where we serve, it's significantly higher and has it's been 20% higher than the state average. One of the things that we saw, um, this is called the, this is for the birth certificate data. It actually showed a slight trend reversal from 2016 to 2017 for preterm birth rates, both in Passaic County and in Patterson. A 15% decrease in Passaic County and a 10% decrease in Patterson itself. Um, there were some, uh, I think, interventions that were put in place in 2016, so we think that this, this is a positive trend, but it's still too high, and this is kind of the main gist of the slide. When you look at this, um, the disparity is above the line, right? So uh, black and Hispanic residents still have a disproportionate share of preterm births as seen by the line over the, uh, the orange bar there. So even though the trend has decreased and decreased for white and Asian, it has decreased for Hispanic and black, but it's still well above the bar. Mm -hmm. So how do we reach out to these women? Um, how do we you know, connect them to care earlier? How do we inform them about the importance of prenatal care? How do we talk with them about the fact that um, you know, accessing services ahead of time, and this is you know, a big initiative. Um, so I'm gonna back up a little bit, actually. So um, this bottled down to where our area of focus was based on the data. That our highest risk for preterm birth rate in Passaic County was for Hispanic women of childbearing age in Passaic City, it's a new geography, and then certain zip codes in Patterson. And then also for African American women was in certain zip, zip codes in Patterson. So that's all great. We know where the problem is. Our planning grant then said, okay, now we want you to start to try to talk to three distinct groups um, in order to see what tools we have that exist to address this need and how can we better utilize those services. So we were tar tasked with talking to physicians who serve these women. Um, in the state of New Jersey, there's what's called a perinatal risk assessment. I'm not sure if that's in, in New York as well, but it has to be filled out for every pregnant woman, specifically on Medicaid. 
And that information provides a lot of detail about the social service needs that that individual might have. So the idea is to connect <coughs> pregnant women into food security or employment or insurance, et cetera. So there's something that already exists in the state, but it's contingent upon doctors filling out the PRA. So we were to meet with physicians, we were to meet with community organizations that serve clients in those zip codes to talk to them about the fact that this is an issue, right? So to talk to you about if this was an issue in your, hey, this is an issue, we all need to be aware of this. There's a tool that community-based organizations can also use and we need you to be aware and start to utilize that to better service the needs of, of these women. And we also wanted to talk to women themselves in those zip codes to say, hey, what's going on? What are your barriers? How can we help to, to kind of alleviate that? What knowledge can we, can we gain from that? And so we um, are working to really better coordinate with some of the existing resources and the different groups that work in this area specifically. We have held some focus groups with women. We've learned a lot about their perceptions of the care that's available in the community, um, that they prefer to maybe go outside of the community in many cases. Um, how they feel they're being treated when they do access care, um, some of the socioeconomic barriers and, and other things. So we're still really in this information gathering phase with this project. Um, and we are in the process of meeting with the state of New Jersey to say, hey look, we know this is an important issue of yours. It's a critical need in our community. The HCPC has worked with the Pathways Community Hub model. We have the structure. Invalid option. Oh, oh. That model has been very effective in addressing preterm birth rates in communities like Ohio. Um, there's a specific pregnancy pathway for the Pathways Community Hub model. I think they reduced the rates of preterm birth by like 20% or something in the community that they use that model in. And so we want to talk to the state of New Jersey to say, hey, we think we have some really great tools here. We'd like to your authorization to be able to use this to make the needs of this community. So that's just kind of a I don't know, is that an issue? Is preterm birth rates or income mortality an issue? What, that, what are the ages for the women? For the women, it was women of childbearing age. So um, really broad, really, really broad. Okay. Um, I'm not gonna bore you with the pediatric in-home intervention. Again, we've had some challenges with that, with client recruitment. We certainly think that there's a fear of, uh, in the community, difficulty going into homes, um, cultural differences, and then the pathways to success for seniors, we're in the process of launching. Um, again, the idea behind that is to work with seniors before they fall. So we're going to identify folks through the Geriatric Emergency Department at St. Joe's and also through community forums with our partners that serve the seniors. We're going to use the same fall assessment tool um, and we're going to have a cohort of 20 individuals from the community organizations and 20 individuals who've already hit the hospital system see if they're interested in participating, work with a community health worker, address their in-home environmental needs, and also connect them to whatever social services they may need in the hopes that we will keep people independent in their homes and prevent falls um, for as long as possible. So it's a pilot project. If it goes well, we hope that it'll expand. Um, but it shows the strength, I think, in partnership and also in prevention. So that's that. Um, and then that there's that big question, right? How do we become sustainable? I think one of, that was one of those questions. I mean, I think you know you always have to prove yourself. So we're finally in a spot now that we have about a year's worth of data, and we're hoping to be able to prove ourselves, right? To manage care organizations, to our partners, to say, hey, we've done some great work here. Um, Community-based organizations are vital to that. We can't close a pathway if we don't have the right partners around the table in order to meet those needs. Um, because we've had those right partners, we've moved this other needle on unnecessary utilization. So how do we connect all the dots? And I think we're in a better place certainly now that we're about a year in. Um, you know, the tools are important for those. I don't mean that you have to use the Pathways model or that you have to use NowPow or that you have to, but I'm really here to inform you that those have been our experiences um, and not without pitfalls. <laughs> so. Um, you know, I, I really just kind of, I think, want to end where we started. Um, this is a quote that goes along with this, that we do have to learn from the journey while not losing sight of the destination. So um, I think the destination is to be great, you know? Healthcare is a complicated issue. Um, social service is a complicated issue, but finally the fact that it's all getting connected on a national level, on a funding level, um, I think is beneficial to, to everybody. So that's the end of my spiel. I know I, I sped up a lot at the end, but...
Thank you so much. Tim. So, do we have any more questions, a conversation, any thoughts you guys had? Um, again, you know, bearing in mind that, you know, I invited Kim while a lot of her work is very, very much, you know, specifically targeting populations and health issues, the, the process is not unlike what we've been talking about. And I think that that's really important. And, um, you know, to hear how one region, you know, is figuring it out. And, you know, the more I listen, and the more I read, and um, I think we shared with all of you the statement that we, that we prepared and read, you know, around the country, there is more and more, both from healthcare systems in conjunction with managed care organizations, but lots of upfront investments just in what we all do, you know, in social determinants, because the, the awareness and the acknowledgement that, you know, you can address diabetes or asthma or a million other health issues, but if folks are just going back to a same set of circumstances in their communities where they don't feel safe, where they, don't have access to the things that are just standard basic needs, then it, it won't matter, right? And that's what we do best. That's what we know we do best as organizations together. And I just, I just want to take a moment to uh, just applaud the work that everybody in this room and the folks that aren't here today, you know, have, that we've all been doing together. Because when we talk about breaking down those silos and be willing to have conversations and be open to the idea of maybe changing the way we do what we do that's a big that's a big leap and everybody's been in it and I just I just want to say thank you and say that you know it's not for naught we're 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 getting there and it is a long haul and it is a big process um, so to that end does anybody have any other questions specifically for Kim I know privacy was a big thing that has come up with data Pat that's something you've asked about a lot right so how did you, maybe that's something you could talk to a little bit about how you address that? Sure. So um, making sure that we're in compliance with all of HIPAA regulations, et cetera, because we really are a subsidiary of St. Joseph's right now, we're able to, to work with that. But we have the informed consent process so that anybody who's part of our Pathways to Success program has agreed to be able to, to talk on their behalf um, in compliance. Yeah, well, also these other organizations, they won't be, they're not HIPAA uh, entities. So have you, has anybody else dealt with that? So that part of the consent doesn't even apply to for them, right? Because they're working with our organization, right. and so we're able to work yeah. on their behalf. So the way that it is is written and articulated, that we're able to coordinate for them. Um, with the NowPow platform, there is a designation when you kind of sign on, sign on as a as a, a utilizer that you're either a HIPAA covered or a non HIPAA covered, so that all of that is is within the agreement as well. Um, yeah. So we're, I don't even know how to ask the question. I'm going to just give you an example of my organization yeah. um, and send Jen a couple of people down. We have a contract, a government contract, where they regard the data as theirs. Mm -hmm. So has that been an issue and how do you deal with that? Well, one of the areas that we are at a disadvantage um, is not seeing the Medicaid data from the state of New Jersey so uh, because we're not a certified ACO. So I can tell you that it looks like we're reducing utilization based on the information we can see, but I don't know if they're going to another hospital um, within the state. So it's similar, right, situation that the state owns that data and I don't have access to that part yet. Um, I think from a standpoint of where we see our community-based organizations in this process is that, as you mentioned, being referral receivers, mm -hmm. right? So that you're helping to receive those referrals and working with those clients. And so I don't need access to your data. So you just have that. the results of our refer the referral? I have the results gets. of the pathway. I can okay. say that this need has been met. Um, and that we can be working with this individual now as far as the work that you do that should not mm -hmm. then impact what you've done with those clients moving forward. Just to dovetail though, uh, at Northwell anyway, we do have access to the Medicaid data for Long yeah. Island. Uh, we also have our own data from our hospitals. So one of the goals of this collaboration between Northwell and Healy and the Health and Welfare Council is to be able to set up partnerships to share that analytics capabilities with the CBOs because we recognize, as everybody is saying, that there's a lot of untapped resource uh, allocation going on in the community serving patients where they live. 
and we're not really effectively connecting and partnering between the health system and the community. And so, obviously, the goal is to have healthier people, healthier neighbors. Um, so, how can we effectively bridge all of the capabilities that we have together to, to make that more more realistic? And and just to piggyback on what Nat just said, um, Northwell has graduated community health workers, and Nancy Copperman is going to be meeting with the community engagement work group to talk about, and again, it's not that we're going to exactly do exactly what Northwell's doing, but Northwell has a community health worker program. So Nancy's going to sit down with our community engagement work group and talk about Northwell's program, and then we can look at, well, how do we adapt it? How, what could we do to make sure that it's even more <laughs> responsive in community to, you know, to, so, so, it, these conversations are so important because we're, I think we are, at the end of the day, all working towards the same end goal, right? Is to serve communities and to help people. Just one thought, Mike. And, and, and the other thing that, I, that I, I'm sure we've brought up before in this room, but I think it, it needs to be repeated is what we have seen, and John and I sat at a, a meeting several months ago where there was somebody from Northwell, there was somebody from a managed care organization, there was somebody from a community-based organization, specifically in ha specific kind of housing issues. And there is not great care coordination. There is a gap between what the healthcare systems are doing, the, what the managed care organizations are doing, and what we're all doing. So if we can, we think, I believe, that, that what we're building here could be that thing that fills that gap, that meets everybody where they are and brings folks together. So um, I think that that's also really important to think about in the big picture of the work that we're doing is how do we fill those gaps and, and make sure that, that there's like a continuum of care you know, that's a little bit more fluid. And just two points. One of the things with the, the true Pathways Community Hub model, like the HCPC would not actually be employing any community health workers. They would be based within the community-based organizations right but working as one voice under the HCPC. So that as opposed to a family that maybe needs child services and the parents need services, you wouldn't be having a revolving door of providers coming to that home. You would really be having one case manager, <coughs> but that's communicating with all of the organizations. So we would ultimately want to drive to that. Um, and the other point that, that, that you raised, which is a great one, is at least in the state of New Jersey, right, through the through the managed care, there was a mandate that um, you had to have like care coordination. So a lot of managed care organizations just hired care coordinate care coordinators. And that's great, except we've found that many times they're very siloed. They don't go out to the community, right? They're maybe navigating within the hospital system or within the healthcare system or within the plan system. The, the benefit of our work in connecting all of these is really, I mean, literally our community health worker, you know, will go to somebody's house, will meet folks in, she, she has, which she shouldn't, but, you know, folks who are homeless, um, you know, will meet them either at the shelter or, or has had, you know, some conferences in her car, um, because if you're from the community and you're connected to the community and you, you're a certain type of person, you have to be a special person to do that work. Um, but. I think those were silos before as well. Because you could have a community health worker, but if they're not in the community, it's not. So, so Mike question, and then Maurice. <laughs> so I just have a question about how much um, thought has been given to uh, using peers and behavioral health uh, as well as the, uh, or in conjunction with the community health workers, or when you approve them, approve the peers at the same time, because they basically do the same type of work, uh, focus more on the behavioral health side, but they need to have a global view of the patient, so uh, you get more of the workforce if you uh, also included them. That would be, that's great. I know there is a peer-to-peer -peer program that Eva's Village, which um, works a lot of with folks who, you know, transition. Well, a lot of our organizations uh, with the Advanced Health Network, they're all behavioral health right. organizations mostly, right. but they have a lot of peers. That right. Build that's a great, that's great. Thank, thank, thank you. you. Maurice, you have a question? Yeah. First, I want to say thank you for the picture. I love images because uh, it takes you to different places. And uh, it comes up with, you know, my question is like, how do we as a group, how are we going to be connecting some of the things like you're doing as a healing type in the side of New Jersey? And then I go into, okay, how do I, as a CBO who has a family focused model, like right now, for example, we work with the seniors and we're doing a special, 
you know, like a program to figure out what's going on in terms of the use of the ER and doing a study that will end in June. So as I listen to you and I see all this thing and I can see the different pathways, the kind of social determinants, like if you name 20, we already identify in five, six when we work with the family. I'm saying, okay, which way do I go here? So it's like, it, it's, it's the picture as a group and also as a CEO. I'm like, okay, how do I connect with the St. Joseph, for example? Who do I go to? You know, even when she mentioned the uh, Long Beach, and I'm saying to myself, we're in Nassau County, and I'm looking at, okay, my people use Winter of and look at that. It's like so much good in my head, so I don't know all these questions. <laughs> so, so our alliance, our consortium, the, the, is all community based organizations. So we have other partners here and that at the table because their voices are valuable, right? But what we're, we, we Establish this consortium is all community-based organizations, all just like you. And the idea, the goal ultimately <coughs> is that we will have, you know, our own, we have already our network of organizations, but we will, you know, we, we're working towards finding, identifying a platform, identifying what kind of data we want to focus on, what we want to bring together, because you just like you said, you know. Every one of our nonprofits, if you're getting money from somebody, you have to collect data, right? Because you have to report on whether you're doing the work that you say you're going to do. So we believe the data is there, the information is there. It's how do we bring it all together so that we can, together as a, remember we started way back when talking, we're not thinking just about our individual CBOs, but as a sector, as a sector of um, health and human service agencies that are deeply rooted in community, how do we, you know, combine our efforts and our information so that we can collectively say, look, this is what we do, and this is how we can work with you so that your needs are, you're reaching the people you need to meet, but we're also serving communities in a more constructive, um, more efficient way. Does that make sense? So we're not there yet, Maurice. We don't have the answers, but we're working towards getting to those that place. And I'll be honest with you, we don't either. You know, when we had our first community advisory board meeting, um, it was great. Every tons of great energy, positive energy in the room, and there still is that. But you sit down and you think you want to have the roadmap already laid out, right? So we we sat down and we said, okay, social determinants of health, and we did exercises and fill out what work group you'd like to be on, and and that started, and then it kind of stopped, right? And so then we're re envisioning how can we better utilize our partners around the table and. We really, our year moving into 2019, we're gonna be talking about the power of the CAB. That's gonna really be our focus, the power of this community advisory board. And I think starting meetings by doing um, boundary spanning leadership activities to really start to break down those kinds of, get to know each other better, um, figure out how we can share data, whether that be as a large group or you know one-on-one -on -one agencies, partner on grant applications. You know, I think funding is always a big part of the work that we do. Um, but I see a lot of value in the NowPal platform and building that resource directory because it's going to allow our partners to connect with one another and to see what's happening. No, it's it's there's just even the process of building the resource directory where um, partner organizations have to fill out all of the things that they do has been so insightful, right? You'll get something back that's like, I didn't know that they did, you know, they supplied furniture, or I didn't know that they, and and it's not even that I didn't know, but the, the organization that's next door to them didn't know, right? So I think that that's where we're hoping to drive that resource directory on a platform that is vetted and is updated through the NowPal system on a regular basis, not something, you know, you can collect data and it's old tomorrow. So making sure that it's updated and that it's utilized, I think is community asset mapping. That's really what it is. You have enough assets. It's what do we have? How do we know about it? And how do we use it? And we want to make sure that our LRCVO partners get paid for the work that they do because with the additional references are going to come costs, right. right? So that's another very big piece is how is this going to all be funded and who's going to pay for the, I mean, the, the great thing about now how is the referral, but also, you know, if we have hundreds of new referrals without money to back up those referrals, that's a problem on the grassroots level. What I did love, which Nat brought up, is that bi-directional data sharing, that it's not just us reporting out data to the healthcare systems, but that in turn, they're giving us information that will help us better serve the people that we serve to. And I think that's what the health information exchange goal to be at a regional or a statewide level is. You know, I advocate regional.
Um, I think maybe that touched on some of the pitfalls of coalition building. I'm looking at my at my list. I mean, we've still had power struggles. We have politics. We have you know all those normal pitfalls. People don't want to share information because if you shine a light on something that maybe isn't working that well, um, you're, you're, there's fear of jeopardizing your own funding or your own. So I mean, there's a lot of barriers to get over. Um, and I think even organizing the, the community advisory board is that's been one of our our darker spots on there, but we're getting there. <laughs> Any other questions? How permanent do you think that this can be? For us, for Healy? I mean, the Health and Welfare Council is committed to health equity. That, you know, when we kicked off the count, the conference last March, that I don't know how many of you were here, were not here, but it was, where, where were we at PSDG? When we had Cincy Hernandez from Families USA and Jacob was a panelist and Elizabeth Benjamin from C that was that was our in addition to kicking off the grant, it was really as an organization we are committed this so so even when the funding from the state stops, you know, our goal is to maintain this coalition, okay. this alliance and to keep working. You know, money is obviously gonna be important to keep it going. We're hoping there will be implementation dollars. That's what you know, we really are hoping that we will have this this plan, this business plan, and a, and a way to, to implement it, and then be able to attach it to some money. Um, we don't know yet. The state's not been very clear about that yet. Okay. Um, so we don't know where, what will happen, but we're certainly keeping our eye on that. But in terms of health equity, um, that's, that's not going anywhere. And that really is, you know, that I, I don't ever want to take the, the, you know, the focus off of that word equity and making sure that we're, you know, make, making access to quality of life and care, not just medical care, but all, you know, equitable across Long Island. Um, so before I forget, a couple of how a little couple of last minute announcements, and I'll send you guys on your way. And it's early; it's not even noon. Um, somebody brought up a question about the sustainability, and it actually is a challenge that I have. So one of my jobs is to, you know, in the very beginning, I was reaching out to the folks who initially signed on to the grant to support the grant application, and then reconnecting with people and bringing people on board and look at this room, it's been filled all the time, but there, there is sometimes a challenge for me to keep people engaged or to engage new community-based organizations to come on board because it's not too late. So I would just ask all of you that when you're in your kind of own networks, if you can, you know, think about Healy and, you know, feel free to pass on my contact information to anybody else that might be interested in coming on board. We, we have really tried to be as inclusive as possible um, and if you, and you don't have to say it right now, but if there's something we're not doing well, if there's a way that you feel we're missing the boat in terms of outreach, I think we inundate you with emails. I'm hoping that the portal will sort of put an end to some of that as more and more people get on the portal and we utilize it. But, you know, I hope I'm as accessible and John is as, as, as accessible as we possibly can be. But if there is something you think we can do better or that we're not doing, you know, enough of, but I need your help too, because we want to grow this and we want to make this a Long Island wide initiative, not just, you know, the folks in the room and we want to keep building on it. So just keep that in the back of your minds. Um, and then the last announcement, um, the Health and Welfare Council, so separate from Healy, but our whole umbrella organization, is having our quarterly meeting on January 24th at Malloy College in Farmingdale. Some of you were at one of our meetings there way back when. Um, what time is the meeting, John? Registration's at 9.30. I think registration starts at 9.30. Our guest speaker is going to be Steve Israel, and he's speaking about, I don't know. I should know. Does anybody know? Don't email it to us. <laughs> um, let me have my notes. I forgot what the topic is, but you should have gotten I think it's the impact of the election on Long Island. Thank you. Thank you. The impact of the election on Long Island. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I think that's what it is. Yeah, I think I you're right. You're right, and that would make sense. And Steve is, I don't know if any of you have ever had the chance to listen to him speak, and he, the guy knows politics better than anybody I've ever talked to. So it, he is an engaging, dynamic speaker, and um, and he just wrote a really cool book called um, Big Guns, which is a satire of the gun lobby, which is um, sitting on my nightstand. I haven't read it yet. I'm going to. Um, but anyway, so 
So again, this is an, an event of the Health and Welfare Council of Long Island. If you, your agency is not yet a member of the Health and Welfare Council as a convening organization, you can certainly join. And then I think if you're non-member, there's a non-member fee that you can pay. Um, so if you haven't gotten notification about the quarterly meeting, you can just let John or me know by email and we'll make sure that that information gets out. I know a constant contact has been going out, but I'm not sure if everybody here got it. So any questions? I would just like to know if this was helpful. Was this helpful to kind of hear yeah. the story? Yeah. yeah. Um, and I, I did bring some business cards, and I, I said I have like a little, but this is pr probably not anything that you're interested in. So, um, but I do have my contact information if you have any questions, or I can be a resource. I want to just say thank you again, Kim. She schlepped all the way here from New Jersey for us. So, aka the other side of the world, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It was really, really helpful. Well, it was my yeah. honor and pleasure to be. And I joked coming in that if you're in Long Island, you never go to New Jersey, and if you're in New Jersey, you never go to Long Island. Right. So, so we just proved everybody.